I have here a potato with a straw that's been pushed all the way through it. How can you do that? Well, have a go yourself. All you need is a potato and a straw. Now, if you try and push it in really slowly, it doesn't take long before the straw buckles and it doesn't really go in at all. How can you get it through? Well, what you've got to do is you've got to hit it really quickly. If you do that, it means the straw goes a long way into that potato. Why does it do this? Well, this is to do with Newton's second law. So Newton's second law states that the force is proportional to the rate of change of momentum. Now, if I rearrange this equation, I can say that the force multiplied by the change in time is equal to the change in momentum. And actually, there's a special name for this. If we look at the force multiplied by the time for which it acts, this is what we call the impulse. Now, this impulse uh, is basically when you have an external force acting on something and the the momentum of the object changes. And we can define the impulse as the product of a force acting on an object and the time for which it acts. And this basically gives rise to the change in momentum of that object. Now we can look at it graphically. If we maybe had a graph of force against time, then we might plot how the force on an object changes with time. And effectively, if we look at the area underneath this graph, for perhaps a force acting for a certain amount of time, the area under that graph is equal to the impulse. Now, in real life, we don't always have things that act uh, in our kind of perfect physics world. What we have are maybe real balls that bounce, okay? And over the duration, that, that fraction of a second as it's maybe making the impact and bouncing back up again, the, the table is providing the force back upwards. But it won't be a constant force for the whole time of that collision. And we can maybe look at this on another type of force time graph. And what we actually see is that the force isn't constant over that collision. But again, the impulse, or the thing which causes that change in momentum, is still going to be equal to the area under that graph. Now, when we have some numbers on this, we, we can't always work it out precisely. We might approximate using triangles, or we might have to count the individual squares, taking note of the size of the force and the time, which is often in milliseconds, to find the impulse and therefore the change in momentum of that object. So in order to actually get the straw all the way through the potato, it's all about how quickly we change the momentum of this straw in my hand that we had initially. If we change it quickly, then we're going to have a bigger force at the end of the straw, which means the, the straw actually goes further into that potato. We can also think about the reverse. How is it that you reduce the force on an object? Well, if you've got something perhaps like an egg and you drop it, then when you catch it, you move your hand down very slightly. And what this does is this increases the collision time. Now, it doesn't matter uh, how quickly the egg is going, because the change in momentum of the egg is going to be the same. If you increase the collision time, though, it means we have a smaller force acting. But if we change that uh, momentum over a smaller amount of time, then the egg will break. Why is this? Well, for the same change in momentum, we have a very small collision time, and that means we have a very large force acting in order to change the momentum of that object. And this is the reason why we use car airbags. What they do is they increase the collision time for that collision. So although uh, the, the driver inside, they might change their momentum by the same amount, we increase that collision time and that means the force gets smaller. So a bigger collision time means that an object experiences a smaller force for that same change in momentum.